did everything. Hey guys, I just want to do a quick shout out to our boy Paul before our video starts who sent me this wonderful programming shirt. If you're a huge nerd like me and you love shit like this, uh, you can get it, uh, you can buy your own in the description down below. So thanks to Paul. It says, yes, I am a programmer. No, I don't care about your app ideas because I know we've all been there. And on the back, in case it's not familiar enough, it says, not even for equity. God knows we've all been there. Uh, but uh, thank you to Paul for sending me the shirt. I love it, man. I appreciate it. And if you want to get your own, you can do it in the description. I hope you enjoy this very unique interview April and I did. And it's recording. All right, guys. So uh, I've been a little busy. I haven't had a chance to interview a developer. And the one I did, we're waiting on some things to finish it up. So in this week of Behind the Code, we decided to do something a little different. So April, my girlfriend, is actually going to interview me and ask questions relating to code and maybe some personal stuff. Uh, we actually haven't discussed what it is. I hit her with this this idea on our way to go pick up dessert. Like 10 minutes ago. All right, so what you got, baby? Okay, so um, try and give us why you code. Um, well, I've talked about this before on my live streams usually. Um, I originally got into software when I was doing coding in college um, and I was learning Java. I really actually hated it and it really kind of killed coding for me, but I knew that it was a great career choice and I was, I kept on trying to code things. I started my channel as a way to learn and help me get a developer job, but uh, I really fell in love with web development and that's why I am now a web developer and I started focusing in on JavaScript, specifically through sites like Free Code Camp. But why I really code is because I don't like being poor. Uh, I there it is! <laughs> Can we get some money size up yeah. in this bitch? So, yeah, I, um, I was sick of being broke, and I've talked about it a couple times where, you know, we my mom had bought us groceries. There's one very specific time in April and I's lives where we, uh, we spent our last, like, $5 on a burrito that we ate, and it was spicy as shit. <laughs> I remember that. You were crying. It was, it was spicy as shit. <laughs> and, like, the next day, his ball... <laughs> Baby, baby, let's keep it PG. All right, it was very spicy, and uh, we suffered through it together to eat it. Um, another time was when uh, we were at Costco, and I couldn't afford to buy any underwear, and like we were spending the last few bucks on food, and that was kind of the time where it was enough is enough, and I, I decided to stop going to school and take a job and work myself up from there, and that was a year, year and a half ago. Yep, year and a half ago. Okay, so my next question is a follow-up to that question. For those who struggle to capture any type of coding or developing, like, we understand that, you know, a portion of pay is a good motivator for you, but what, what about for those who, where pay isn't really it, how do they find their dream job in coding? Uh, I, to find their dream job in coding? I think it takes a little bit of research and a little bit of diving in. So I always say that there's three different paths. There's the self-taught path, there's the college path, and there's a boot camp path. Now, depending on what you do, self-taught, you could be learning multiple sub languages, doing whatever. You can, you can kind of do like a buffet sampler of languages. You can do enterprise applications with Java. That would be similar to the college path. You're really, uh, especially in the Cal States, I believe Java and Python, yeah. But what can you do with those things? Like, give us a bigger picture of what those codings can do. Because let's say that someone has a really great app idea and they want to see it, you know, come to life. Or let's say they have this really great web. Or, like, what are those types of substantial things that they can create using coding? Okay, so the, the first and foremost is web applications, what I do for, for a living. Um, if you have an idea for a website or a web application, and that could be something like like Twitter. Twitter is a web application. You have a social media that you think you're like, look, I want to, uh, you know, Matt and I have joked about making a Twitch, uh, you know, Twitch live streaming, where it we call it Twitch titty streamers, and it's nothing but like webcam chicks with their boobs out, like playing games. That, that is literally uh, something we joked about. But um, 
if we want, say we were serious about that, if we wanted to build that, we'd have to have web applications. Now, if we have a mobile app and we want to build mobile applications, we would have to learn um, the languages that that involves. That would be Android or Java. Android works off Java. And then there's iOS, which I believe is C Sharp or C++. I'm not an iOS developer or the language Swift. So these would be the languages. You just have to kind of think it through. What is it I'm trying to make? And it could be both, right? So um, there's a lot of free resources for web development because it's on the internet. It's, it's, it, it's encompasses it all, so it's a lot easier to do. And web development's really, really hot right now. So you really have to think it through. What is it you want to make? And what is it you want to do with it? Right, and how, if that's the case, let's say that if someone wanted to use some type of programming to aid something in like a space program or something on Mars or anything like that, how would they go about researching something that's extensive? What do you mean by extensive? Well, <laughs> extensive, like how does someone go about researching what needs what in what particular job? Let's say that someone wants to be an astronaut but doesn't want to be an astronaut and to the point where they don't want to have to go through all the physical trials but they want to be part of that career oh. how do they find a path and a career that they want via coding gotcha gotcha so um the great thing about software is every company needs someone that almost every large company is going to have a developer of some type whether it's a web developer whether it's someone managing the database and analytics whether it's somebody um, building an app for that company so it really depends. But if say, you want to get into a set industry, uh, me, I, I'm the type of guy, I, I'm very open to almost any company because I'm there to code. Uh, there are more companies I'd be attracted to. I'd love to work with a social media company because of my interest in YouTube. Um, these cats are about to start throwing down. Uh, so, uh, um, but if you're interested in space, you need to start applying for internships at you know these companies. Just like um, Northrop Grumman would be an example of an engineering company that hires developers that works with you know large uh, government contract companies. So uh, applying for internships is great. Maybe starting and th there's the other ways, right? Where you could like start an engineering channel or start a software channel. You do start a blog. Do something. Do something a little outside the box where you're showing your passion for this field. Start volunteering in that field. I've volunteered through Code.org um, in the past. Just two months ago to put, get that on the resume. So you can keep kind of getting these little baby steps there while still learning software to show your interest in it. When you show interest as a candidate to be selected and it makes you stand out a little bit, that, that's really what your job is as someone who's trying to be a junior, in, fill a junior level role with no resume experience. It's what can I get on my resume in the meantime so that when I'm applying with everybody else, they go, oh, but this guy did this also. So I really think he would really like the role and be perfect for it. Okay, so I think you hit on a key point about talking about the passion that you were expressing right there. What happens when someone doesn't have or is just like, I wouldn't say in the beginning, but let's say uh, maybe like a mediocre start where, okay, I've, they've listened to you talk, they're starting a blog or they're starting something and then they want to apply for an internship. Now on that internship, I've looked through many of them and which say that the requirement is that they're either a junior or sophomore in some type of science-based uh, career and that they don't want anyone, you know, how do you approach something where you're not qualified according to what they want? So um, this basically sounds like not meeting job requirements or internship requirements. Now there are employers who absolutely will not bend their, their rules, but for the most part, uh, when it comes to job requirements, especially in software, because it's in such a high demand, is they're more willing to be lenient. So the, the excuse that, hey, we're only looking for juniors or sophomores or people who with degrees, it's not a valid excuse. I have yet to finish my degree and I'm looking to go back recently and I'm a fully employed, salaried uh, web developer making decent money. Um, now this can apply to internships as well. There are those companies that look, we only hired this type of person, but that's why it's so important that your LinkedIn and your resume showcase your projects and your skills and how you're standing off. So because when they look at this guy and say, look, you know, um, he's got 12 projects in the technologies we're looking for. Meanwhile, all these other guys 
who worked in maybe Java or C++ or Python that isn't even the technologies they're working with, but they do have their degrees or they, you're, you're more likely to be picked because at the end of the day, they want someone who can hit the ground running and same goes for internships. There's no harm in applying. It's just a little bit of time. So if you, if you can get your resume to look as perfect as possible, go ahead and apply. I apply to jobs, or I would apply to jobs, and I encourage people to apply to jobs where you meet about 60 to 70% of the requirements. If, you, if you're doing that, you're probably in the top 10% of candidates. Can't remember it. Um, kind of coming away from jobs and other things that we've been discussing, what do you think the most important thing is, like rule number one for learning code? Rule number one is, well, there's a couple of rules. Let's, let's go over the rules. Rule uh, number one. Rule number one is code every day. That's rule number one, hands down, code every day. Um, be involved in the community is rule number two. And what I mean by that is um, you don't not necessarily start a blog or a YouTube channel or anything like that, but in be part go to meetups, go to hackathons, be part of Facebook groups like the wonderful Code Tech and Caffeine, our official Facebook group. <laughs> like that. Uh, <laughs> so um, Sell out <laughs> yeah. uh, But the the idea being that when you surround yourself by people who like to code not only do you find people to help you learn and resources, but you also keep yourself on track, right? So it's like um, it's it's like when you're in school, if you're hanging around the kids always smoking pot versus the kids who are studying, you're more likely to smoke pot, smoke pot. and st study less. And it kind of goes the same for life, right? If all your friends are the guys who work out all the time or are fit, you're more likely to say, you know what, maybe I should work out today. Um, and same thing as coding. If you're surrounding yourself with reminders of how you need to code daily and how you need to get better and, and what your goal is, right? So set a goal and then put your surroundings around it so that you have things supporting you and it's always on your mind. I think some good ways of reminding yourself to code are putting notes in the refrigerator in the bathroom. <laughs> they do that. Sorry. That's a fat joke. <laughs> okay, baby. Um, or it's like always remind yourself. Always put it a reminder where you look the most. Is this like a weight yeah, loss so, shit? Yeah. They'll put a little yeah, post it note saying, yeah. you don't need like that. Like they put like put pictures of, you know, things that you. Little, little life hacks for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, what are, oh, there are some things that we were talking about. Um, I'm pretty sure like a couple of days ago where. You, I, you were trying to decide or what you were telling me was that you should always learn the newest type of code that's out, like the newest version. Why is that? And what if a company doesn't use the newest type and you know the newest type? Like, how do you have that conversation? Yeah, definitely. So um, what, it, what April's referring to is uh, learning new frameworks and new libraries. So instead of learning jQuery, spending your time learning jQuery or something a little outdated, you spend your time, like, uh, instead of learning Angular 1, you learn Angular 2. And instead of learning um, jQuery, maybe you learn React. And so what I, what I meant by that is that when you are learning the things that are fresh and new, not only does it typically pay very well, because less people have taken the time to learn it, because been, it's been out lot less time, it's newer, the people who are employed developers have been working in the same technologies for years, uh, so you're gonna have a little bit less competition. You're not competing, but if you go into an older technology, let's say PHP for instance, where you have developers who have been working in PHP for 15 years, you know, 15 years of resume experience in PHP, um, or five, let's just say five plus, you're, go you're going against a lot more competition. But if you learn the newer stuff, not only is it going to be great for you, because you're, you know, Angular 2, for instance, came out four or five months ago. If you started four or five months ago when the beta ended, you're probably in the top 10% of candidates. You're, doing, you're looking really good. Um, and you're not going against too many people. So you put yourself in a position where you know the newer stuff, and thus when companies are looking to start and they're looking for those skills, you're, 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 they're having to choose from less of a um, 
full of candidates. What happens if you meet an employer who says, oh, well, we don't use that version? Do you know our version? How do you convince the employer that your new version is better? So, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to convince them. But the employer may say, look, we use version 2, you know version 1. And depending on the library or framework, typically it's not a massive upgrade. Now that's different in Angular 2, which the two main web, web, language, web libraries are Angular and React. So in terms of Angular, Angular 1 from Angular 2 is completely different. So it's like learning something brand new for about 75% of it. So that's a little bit unique. But usually when you go from uh, one version of a library to a new version, it's not as dramatic as a change. So it's, it's mainly a syntax thing. Um, certain functions have broken and you need to change that. Um, certain things have been added and you need to know that. It formats slightly different. It, uh, the parameters are different. It got more complex. But if you understand the foundation, it's usually all right. Angular 1 versus Angular 2 is slightly different. You didn't answer my question. Explain to me your question. <laughs> Let's say you're having a conversation with your employer, and he's going over the list of things that you know. Mm -hmm. You're saying that because you know the new stuff is going to sell itself. Okay, yeah. So you're not necessarily going to convince a company that has already started a massive project, hey, you know all that code you wrote? Fuck that. Let's rewrite it. No, that, that may not happen. But if you're new on a project, for instance, uh, starting a new application, you may say, I know we just worked in Angular 1 all this time, but let me tell you about the benefits of Angular 2. And you're going to bring this to your architects or your senior devs or the people in management who make these decisions and say, Angular 2, they're like, well, all our devs know Angular 1. Granted, they're senior people, so they can learn things, but do we want to go down this route? This is the benefits of Angular 2, or this is the benefits of React, this is what it can do for you. you just weigh the benefits. Look, let, yes, there's a learning curve, but Angular 2 allows you to um, do SEO, better SEO, because it does server-side rendering versus client-side, as Angular 1 does, and also allows for better routing. So they, there's things in these. When they do these upgrades, they just don't do it because they're bored. There's usually benefits, but the, the downside is there's a learning curve. And so you have to weigh the pros and the cons for future employers. Now, as a junior dev, should you show up and be like, yo, man, use my shit? Probably not. Uh, you should be dynamic enough as a developer that you need, you can say, hey, you know what? I don't know that version, but I, I'm willing to learn it at work and off work. Hey, guys, thanks for watching the video. If you're interested in coding bootcamp, check out devmountain.com, where housing is included in your price of tuition. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share, and support me on Patreon. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.